Welcome to News from Underground, your place and source on the internet for consistent anarchist news. Before we get into the uh, meat of the stories here that we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about, uh, first introduce three announcements coming up. First one will be this Saturday we have our Freedom Gathering. Um, Isaac is going to be doing the uh, I guess anarcho-herbalism, you know, things about, uh, you know, health and things to, I guess, as the common saying is, uh, you are what you eat, right? And that kind of stuff kind of reflects uh, outwardly. And so he's done a lot of studying and research into the subject for, for a long time in healthy food and living. And that's, uh, that'll be the presentation he's going to do. And that's going to be at the Maplewood Anarchy Garden, uh, the first anarchy garden home near the fan. So you guys are welcome. If you guys are watching this, if you live nearby, uh, we'll always have crashing space. We'll always have a, a guest room at the uh, Nevermore Anarchy Garden too. We have a guest room now. <laughs> no more cow sleeping. Another announcement. All right. <laughs> And on Sunday, the day after that, uh, stick around though, because we're gonna be doing another couch. Couch is gonna be on Deadpool now. Uh, if you guys haven't watched it, you know, there's plenty of time. You can also catch it on Prime Wire. And so we're gonna do everything that has to do with Deadpool. So if you guys are comic book lovers, uh, have ever followed uh, the lore about it, we'll be talking very much in depth about that. So I guess a conversation about comic books, Deadpool and trolling, I guess you will say he's a, he's a troll, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a he's a jokester. He's so. a jokester, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's <laughs> I need to. Huh? Yeah. He's a murder of the mouth. So yeah. yeah. He's a baby troll. Uh, I need to see that that movie. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of time. Uh, so that's going to be Sunday at the new Anarchy Garden, the um, Manchester Anarchy Garden. That's the one, uh, Johnny, across the river. So there's some big space couches there. Oh, really? uh, yeah. Nice. So, uh, <laughs> a lot of room, very spacious this time, because last time we had it at the Nevermore, and it was kind of weird at the angle with so many people in that room. Uh, so, I'm thinking that if it turns out to be well accommodated, that seems to be our spot for a couch from now on. Yeah. Um, Maybe we'll have a jam session afterwards. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the last announcement will be that we're going to go to the Students for Liberty conference uh, next weekend. It's uh, Friday through Sunday. And that's going to be Herzog, myself, Phil, and Ty, all four of us. We're going to carpool and go on an epic road trip of an hour and a half <laughs> to D.C. into the heart of Mordor uh, to talk to some uh, liberty-minded people. Getting some arguments liberty with some Ramians and Molinites. Right. <laughs> a lot of constitutionalists are there, a lot of minarchists. It's pretty much a conference for minarchism. Uh, I think probably ran into... Maybe five band caps there. I went there last year, um, and the rest of the majority were, yeah, constitutionalists, libertarians, right? As they say, with the capital L. It's gone. It's gone downhill since the last time I went. All right. <laughs> uh, so that would be an interesting, uh, fun experience to do. I look forward to to debating a lot of people there and see if I can, uh, you know, ask them some pressing questions um, where they stand on a lot of positions, and so. You can say uh, they're a troll, but you know it's time to knock out some some of these bad ideas out there. You know, it's not just and, and communism that's a bad idea. There's a host of a lot of stuff that's out there, uh, a lot of garbage being spewed. So we're gonna have a lot of fun out there. We're gonna bring back a lot of recordings, a lot of video. And if you guys have uh, any questions you'd like us to ask while we're out there, um, let us know. Send it to the operations at the email address. And uh, if you know anyone there you'd like us to debate or uh, confront, otherwise let us know as well. We'll, we'll keep an eye out for them. Um, especially what C4SS and their comic light stuff. Uh, so yeah, let's get uh, started with the news stories. Uh, first story we're going to go over, Virginia taxpayers, victims, right? There's no one, no one pays taxes. Uh, Virginia tax victims pick up $2,435 worth of food and beer bill for mystery guests and a red skin suite. Virginia tax victims will pick up a $2,435 food and drink trap for a luxury box at last month's Washington Redskins playoff game, despite a majority of the suite's unidentified guests attending with no official public purpose, according to state records. To stock that FedEx fuel suite, a state economic development agency made an order involving $1,045 worth for hot dogs, chicken, and other food, $656 for Bud Light, Stellar Toys, and Flying Dog IPA, and $198 for soft drinks and water. Sounds like quite the party. 
You would think. Clearly was. <laughs> <laughs> you would think. Uh, apparently, they thought that there was going to be a lot of people coming to this uh, economic business event that they were trying to promote, and uh, not a lot of people showed up. Go figure. You know, we're not a real business. You can't really allocate your resources efficiently. Uh, when you're playing with other people's money, you know, what do you care? <laughs> and of course, that's the cover story, uh, the lie that they have to kind of put out there. So out of the 15 people that were there in that room, in that suite, only four of those people represented businesses considering expansion in the tax form of Virginia. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of contention in there. The tab was split between uh, what the Virginia Economic, De Economic Development uh, partnership in the Office of Secretary of Commerce uh, and Trade, Maurice A. Jones. Uh, so only two government officials there, him and his aide, and a lot of mystery guests that uh, they wanted to release the names of. Right? Um, things kind of involving your money, things involving, uh, well, yeah, stolen money. This is uh, because some people pay some things privately, they can't disclose some of this information, especially to the Freedom of Information Act. So they kind of detect a lot of uh, stuff that you would know from like a regular business venture, right? You have, uh, you run a business, if you're the CEO or the stock shareholder, so you, you want to look, look, no, uh, item by item, you're like, Where, what are you doing with these expenses? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's uh, hey, give me your money, you can trust us, we're the government, oh, well, okay, what, you're, what are you going to spend it on? That's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're experts at spending money wise. Yeah. Oh. Only the best and the brightest work for the, you know, the Virginia state government. Right. Uh, yeah, so the... Uh... Yeah, well, well I, I do want to point out, so since I've, uh, since I've moved to Virginia, I have noticed a lot of difference between Virginia and Florida in the tax structure and the... Uh, business friendliness, as you will, and Virginia is a lot more hostile towards tax cattle and towards businesses than Florida is. And they wonder why, you know, CEOs and executives don't want to show up to their party to expand into, you know, Virginia. All right. When they're that that tax heavy and that regulatory uh, regulatory heavy. They wonder why everyone's starting their businesses in California. Right. Well, FedEx, <sighs> FedEx feelers look at it in D.C., so they couldn't even bring them into Virginia to kind of consider what Virginia has to offer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and then in this particular area, yeah, they say the catchphrase that the uh, the government gang here has is Virginia's for lovers. Yeah, lover of your of your money, <laughs> what you got to offer. Um, yeah, it's like another mafia. Some of the exorbitant costs here, though, thirty eight dollars for a six pack of Bud Light. Um, that might be because they're at a FedEx stadium and, you know, costs are extraordinarily high at these uh, government subsidized uh, uh, sport hobbies. You see, what happened is they bought all six, one at, the, one at a time, at the bar in the stadium. So they were, you know, seven, eight dollars a piece. Yeah, and they had right. to be flown in. Yeah. Right, yeah. The next day delivery, totally. Right. Yeah, they had to get FedEx to, you know... <laughs> So this, uh, some people say, well, yeah, this is a natural thing to do. You know, businesses go out there and, you know, try to cajole and try to woo business prospects and partnership deals and negotiations. And yeah, that, that is that is true, you know, in, in the real private world setting in which uh, trade is voluntary and there's respect for private property and that, that does occur. Uh, people put up their own capital for uh, for risks, uh, you know, and collateral for loans. That that does happen. There's real risk involved in that. Well, there, there are... You know, there are parties and, and some some raucous events thrown for executives and, and for possible, uh, um, you know, sales to other, other companies. And uh, it's money that they have voluntarily gotten. It's not money that they have stolen from people. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an investment, right? Yeah. An honest, true investment in that. But when you deal with stolen property, when you deal with uh, money you've not... Uh, gather yourself uh, in a voluntary, consensual way, it's not the same, right? It's like equating the same old uh, rape as lovemaking. The two are not the same. Uh, one's consensual, one's uh, coercive. And in this case, uh, these are robbers just doing what they will with other people's money. And so, of course, yeah, these people will not have uh, much of any uh, due diligence to consider respectfully of uh, how best to spend other people's money. It's not... It's not like uh, there's competition or risk of their own to contend with or to look at. 
uh, government and social, so not a business, cannot allocate resources efficiently. So it's all fuck off for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the in the the, just going back to that thirty eight dollar six pack of Bud Light, you know, if you you're working at a chances are that stadium was you know I, I haven't read up on it, but chances are it was you know eminent domained into existence and paid for by public funds. You can bring in some beer from outside, and you can bring in a six dollar six pack of shitty beer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or you. Could, Which Bud Light? Or you could bring an eighteen dollar pack of decent beer, but you know. <laughs> Right, this, uh, the city here created a, a training field for the Redskins, and uh, they're mm-hmm. taught it like, oh, it's going to bring so much money, and it just never happened. Uh, they, they, they charged uh, vendors like thousands, uh, like $1,000 just for, for permission to vend there, and none of them ever made any of that money back. It was a, it was a net uh, loss for many of them. And uh, so, yeah, do you really want to be trusting the same people who kind of put that stuff together, that they have the common sense to know what to do uh, economically in these economic development departments? Uh, yeah, that's a similar thing happened in Florida, actually. Florida, in Florida, a couple of cities, I think it was Fort Myers and Sarasota, uh, or it might have been Tampa, but two cities got into a bidding war to attract the Red Sox, who, were, who, were, who have historically had their winter playing field in Fort Myers. And they got a, into a bidding war to try to, because the Red Sox were thinking of changing cities to a different city. So each city was trying to outspin the other in trying to attract the, the Red Sox to come to the, because, you know, it's going, it's economically, you know, it attracts economic development, which every, we've seen from the Mercatus Institute and in all, all these different studies that that's complete bunk. No facts It's a negative, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a um, net loss. Right. But these two cities get into a bidding war trying to spend money out the wazoo to attract this baseball team that no, barely anybody in the town even cares about anyway. Right. The only thing that they get out of that is just uh, nationalistic pride. That's yeah. it. That's the only uh, garnish of bread and circuses. Bread and circuses. Oh, I'm from Fort Myers. We got the Red Sox. <laughs> even though they're from Boston anyway. So following that up. So, I Apple- believe... Apple to judge dropped in. This story is about San Bernardino killer Sayed Yusufaru, who owned an iPhone 5C, which may have been used, probably was used, in the planning and perhaps even executing of the holiday party terror attack with his wife, Tashfin Malik. The iPhone 5C, just like any other up-to-date iOS or Android smartphone, has dislabel encry- encryption baked into the OS for users who want that level of privacy. And this is for, for good or for ill. Yesterday, the U.S. magistrate, Judge Sherry Pym, ordered Apple to bypass the phone's security features, and furthermore, to provide related technical assistance and to build special software that would essentially act as a skeleton key capable of unlocking the phone. This attempt to set a legal precedent that Big Brother can use to access users' private data without their consent or knowing is a classic use of an opportunity to expand government powers. I mean... It's not like prison is faded from, from our minds with the NSA. There were the prison where they were spying on all our emails and figuring out where everyone was going and trying to decrypt everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no, uh, I guess, Fourth Amendment, right? All those constitutional powers that are supposed to protect your privacy and whatnot. Uh, unconstitutional searches. So my magic piece of paper says this is naughty. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I guess we, I guess... This now we were talking about earlier about I think Google doing something similar. Now it's uh, no, it's, it's great to hear uh, Apple saying "fuck off." <laughs> yeah. well, fuck those guys. <laughs> fuck those guys. <coughs> that is wonderful. That is a wonderful statement of them saying yes. Like no, oh, you guys can eat shit. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. I. I, I so with, I'm a little skeptical of this to be honest. I because Apple has had some history with Safari being a little bit, uh, you know, open um, to the feds. But uh, you know, if if they're really really true about this, and it's not just like some publicity stunt, then you know, I might have an iMac in my future. <laughs> right. I, I'll support them. You know, and I, I know many other people will. I think I remember hearing uh, Steve Jobs never had a license plate. Always kind of refused to get one on his car. So yeah. this, is, this is my property. It's like I don't want to make it look ugly by putting uh, that piece of metal junk on my car. Um, 
So I don't know whether he just never got caught driving. I mean, I guess he has other people driving for him as well at that point, or you now he can pay the fines, or I don't know. But <laughs> well, if you're Steve Jobs, you can get away with more than with more than that, right? <laughs> so Apple's response was a resounding no. Bending the need to demand to infringe on user privacy may set a dangerous precedent for future surveillance. A likely reason why Apple has not caved into this demand is that the security architecture is shared among the devices in their ecosystem, and that such a software can infringe on the privacy of all users. This is why it's a bad idea to give them that kind of software. So they're going to give you the decryption methodology so that they can just see everyone's data. Sure, they may want it for this case right now, but what's to stop them later from saying, oh, this person looks suspicious. Let's just access everything they have on their computer. Yeah. Oh, but trust them, they won't do that. <laughs> you can trust the FBI. <laughs> we'll keep guard of it. We won't share it with anyone. No one can corrupt us. We're the uncorruptible. We're the untouchables. <laughs> yeah, tell that to uh, uh, Ross Ulbricht. Right. <laughs> mm. So Apple's legal grounding in this affair is that the request actually does fall out of scope with what a search warrant is able to provide. A search warrant only provides enough legal power to grant access to that which is already in possession of the incumbent, in this case Apple. This is not the case, as, App, as Apple denies that such a decryption method exists. Therefore, to provide the government with such a decryption method is in excess to the demand and goes outside of the legal authority of the search warrant. Yeah. Uh... I think uh, what they're trying to say is like what they, they don't have a backdoor access on it, but I guess yeah. they're kind of forcing them to oh, just create one. It's like that kind of defeats the whole purpose of all, of all this sort of stuff that you kind of put a lot of work and effort to to do. You um, made the safe for a reason so that people wouldn't be able to do this kind of thing, and you're telling us to add it in. Okay, so we just invalidated what probably ye years of engineering took for a couple for a bunch of engineers. It'll ruin. The price it'll ruin the value that these computing devices have yeah i heard it's like uh, if you own a house it's like hey listen you just want to make sure everything in your house is good and clean and all secure it's hand over a copy of the key to your house and we promise we won't share it with anyone you know we'll just come in whenever we feel like it and make sure you're good and, and feel secure right and, uh, and then anyone asks for security or you can give us a password oh trust us you can trust me trust us <laughs> and, and well also if there is a back door, then there is a back door. That 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 opens up a security breach to begin with. So and as, yeah, and that's yeah. not exactly that Apple would ever want to announce, right? In terms of uh, the products that they sell, that they're secure and encrypted. That doesn't right. bode well with uh, consumer confidence um, and the profit that they make as a business, right? To continue mm -hmm. selling those products. Um, yeah, it's like uh, it's a death sentence. It would seem to be. Yeah. Um, but of course, uh, the FBI, you know, these people don't care about businesses. <laughs> they don't care about uh, your own property and uh, the things that you own. They care about compliance. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like, the, uh, I like the, the little wrench that McAfee threw in, John McAfee. So, so he's unfortunately gone the, uh, the presidential route, so he's, he's vying for the throne of tyranny, as, as you would say. Um, but he, he actually spoke up and he said, you know what, stop pestering Apple to try to add backdoors into their software, which you have no business doing. And he said, I will hack this device, I will decrypt it for free. And there are ways to social engineer, you know, his friends, find out what he cares about. You know, you can figure out the password. A good, ha a talented hacker, which is one thing McAfee is, um, can figure out how to decrypt something like that. Yeah, he said that uh, he just needs, you know, rent him a hotel room, bring him like at least 12, a dozen <laughs> hookers, um, mounds of cocaine, and uh, he'll, he'll, get it, he'll get it done. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then uh, it, it, at least a few uh, $38 six packs of Bud Light. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but that only brings up the true intention of what they're actually really after. Hmm. They're only using this as an opportunity to expand their power is like of course yeah they're they're using this in, as an excuse what they really want is that decryption software they want to have a backdoor access to everyone's data whenever they feel like it absolutely that's that's why it's such a a great little wrench that he threw in at it because you know it it makes it obvious it makes it obvious that they're they're not looking out for us they're not looking out to 
protect us from the terrorists. They're, they want to spy on us. They want to have that access. Right, this is one of those uh, emergency uh, extension powers. Uh, yeah, they, they want to go after Ross Ulbricht's Mark II. Right, and, yeah. And, 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 and anyone else uh, that they deem to be a, a threat to national security. Yeah. So next up, youth coach called off-duty cop a dick for heckling her team. Now she's facing a year behind bars. What happens when a little league coach calls a heckler at a girls basketball game a dick? Well, when the heckler is an off-duty cop, she ends up arrested and facing three years in prison. Jessica Kurz, the 31-year-old mother and veteran youth league coach, is crying foul and the local police department is firing back. So this is actually a pretty old story. This happened in, in September, but it, it, um, there was an update recently. And it, it was good news. It was it was the uh, the charges actually were dropped, but uh, this is good to bring up because it really just it really highlights the the police state, frankly, that that we're in in many states. And so so this is this happened in Texas, and um, depending on what story you are, you you believe. So some people may believe the cops, some people may believe her. It really doesn't matter because it's a ridiculous story either way. So if you believe her, then she's be she's being arrested for saying one semi swear word, calling a guy a dick. That is just egregious behavior, right? Uh, and if you believe the cop, then she was on a, a tirade of cursing. Of course, the highlighted word that he wrote in his report was still dick, so that must not have been that heavy of a tirade. Right. tirade. But uh, so according to the cop, she was going on a tirade, and then she you know, supposedly ran away when he was trying to arrest her. An off-duty cop? Yeah, an off-duty cop. Apparently he so, was uh, there at a baseball game and uh, was, she was coaching that? Uh, yeah, she team. was coaching one of the teams. And uh, this, this guy just kept uh, heckling <laughs> the, her, her teams right there from, from the benches. And it's just like continually a lot of people are getting upset and she just turned out was like, knock it off, dick. Uh, or something to that effect. And then he just took out his badge and uh, became this, uh, you know, whiny little kid that suddenly just, you know, made called him a name and uh, used that authority uh, to tell him, let's go to the parking lot for a second, let's, go, let's step outside. And, uh, and under that threat of duress, she, she followed him and she, he attempted to kidnap her, arrest her uh, for a victim's crime, for, for, for nothing. And of course, uh, this is one of those classic he says, she says sort of things, but cops are notorious liars. Um, yeah. They'll make up cops are notorious liars who are always believed first on the stand. Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. But it's hearsay. Oh, right, yeah, that would also be considered hearsay. There's no factual evidence. Actually, there was like some video that sort of recorded the event, but conveniently, the court was in session. There was yeah, some they, kind of break. So, yeah, they, so they didn't even, uh, they didn't, she got her arrest warrant in the mail months later. So it takes about two, the, they keep the video for about two months and then they delete it. Yeah. And then she gets the arrest warrant in the mail. Oh, well, too bad you can't actually look at the video that may or may not exonerate you because we waited. Right. Yeah. And she turned herself in too. I mean, she, it's not like she went on the run from the, the popo, but um, she, uh, so, so at least one other person actually uh, sort of corroborates her story. So he, he, he doesn't say exactly that, you know, oh yeah, she wasn't saying anything. Or, but basically his story was, yeah, I was calling a foul and I turned around because it's, it's, um, it's the referee of the game. So he's, he says, yeah, I was calling a, a foul and I turned around to call it and I see a cop suddenly grabbing her by the arm and taking her out. And uh, in the police report, so the police report has her, it's it basically uh, disturbing the peace and fleeing capture. Is, I mean, it's, it's resisting arrest. arrest. Yeah. So it's pretty much BS. describing what uh, the police extortionist did, right? The right. police extortionist there disturbing the peace, and then eventually the police extortionist <laughs> runs away from capture, from assaulting mm. her when he grabbed her arm. Mm. Um, but of course he wears the, uh, well, he wasn't even wearing a magical blue costume this time. Was no, he weird. wasn't wearing a magical blue costume. He was he was just plain clothes. She didn't even know he was a cop. So, when, so then would not anyone just obviously see that what is occurring? Well, there's assault right there. There's attempted kidnapping right there, right there yeah. through the parking lot, and now he's just attempting to escape and run 
run away. Visit yeah. this uh, this cop. Well, I'm sure they they, they probably uh, they probably keep their their magical hardware in their pockets. Oh, all right, so, all right. Oh, oh, look, look, <laughs> can't touch me. I'm I'm magic. I'm a I'm a wizard. I am the law. All right. Freedom of speech. Yeah, it does not exist. Um, Absolutely not. And not even in the. In the if we had any other, if we didn't know already by the freedom of speech zones, which, by the way, Hillary Clinton advocated, people who are voting for her, can you be any more sucked into the matrix? All right. Voters in general, why vote? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so so uh, just, just to add to it, um, in Texas, disorderly conduct, uh, the, in the, in the, um, the stat Texas statutes is that it's actually worded such that uh, profanity intended to quote incite a breach of peace, which is what the hell does that mean? Uh, that is actually a, an arrestable offense. All right, it's uh, to their vague uh, description of um, whatever, whenever they feel like it, it means. So it's, it has to be vaguely worded so they can apply it uh, to anything and everyone. That they deem to be in their way or irritable, or um, like this woman, how dare you stand up to me? You know, do you not know who what I am? <laughs> so, yeah. what I want to know: so the police officer can bring up charges on her, but she can't bring up charges on the police officer, or can I don't know? Maybe the uh, can she not do a citizen's arrest? <laughs> right. No, so in Texas, that's also on the books. An off the uh, um, an, an off duty police officer, even outside of his jurisdiction, has the authority to arrest somebody he sees committing a crime, which technically, using profanity, intended to quote unquote incite breach of peace, is a crime in Texas. <laughs> now there. Uh... Well, at least at least uh, we found out that the uh, the bullshit charges were dropped. Um, and you're mentioning like, can she do anything about it? I don't know. I guess we'll find out whether the lawyers are going to follow up uh, with that. Right? Because a lot of these cases kind of tend to be settled out of court uh, in terms of uh, suing and finding. Yeah, and I doubt I doubt she'll have any recourse. Honestly. Right. The video is just missing, so it's yeah. kind of difficult to kind of follow up with that. Uh, but yeah, good for her. Good thing uh, that kind of got dropped. Uh, so it's facing a year, a year. Yeah. Well, well, I want to say so. So this is actually this goes um, into this connects to agorism, in a way, and this this connects to a uh, one of my favorite books is from uh, Taron Lupo. It's it's um, uh, I wish I could think of the title. It's it's like how to Pirates of the, the Savannah. Huh? Pirates of no, the Savannah. No, no, this one's a nonfiction book. It's 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 like how to how to build an agorist enterprise or an agorist business or something like that. How to make money mm -hmm. off the grid. And um, it's you know so you say agorism is the the, the art of not getting art caught. of not getting caught right. But there is still that case of what to do when you do get caught and you call out to your community. And you get help from your community, and that's what she did. She went to the media. She, you know, she went to her community to help. And and she wasn't, you know, performing agorism or anything. But this is this is a similar thing. This is, you know, something to be lauded for. That's what that's the way she should have gone. Right. And, and when in this victimized when she's being victimized by the state, and that's that's one of the tactics that we need to know as agorists that if we do get caught. We need to know to, you know, reach out to our community, reach out to, to those people that have, you know, media access or, or you know, the, our friends on YouTube. Make sure that people get the word out so that you have, you know, your community coming to your aid. So that at least, at the very least, be more of a pain in the ass than you're worth to the, uh, the heavy hand that's, that's taking you. Yeah, uh, a lot of the pressure uh, will cause things like this for these charters to be dropped in those cases. Mm -hmm. um, and if you guys are watching this and from Richmond or any place like that, uh, let us know if you are being harassed or being threatened um, in that kind of course of action. There's a story that happened here recently about this guy who was uh, threatened because uh, he wanted to live in a, one of those tiny homes he built in his own backyard on his own property. Um, and they came in and told him that you couldn't unless you want to be, uh, you know, be thrown into a cage or, or fined. That was in Richmond. Yeah, in Richmond. Yeah. Oh, so he terrible. can't. So he can't live in his own cage. So they're gonna put him in a cage. Yeah, he can't live in his own little tiny home in a tiny house in his apartment. I mean, his backyard. 
Um, that's, that's actually something that I've been thinking of doing. When I when I pick up my, um, you know, when I save enough money, I was actually hoping to, to get a little plot of land on the outskirts. I guess it wouldn't be in Richmond proper, yeah. so. But, uh, and have a, have a little place for where I could rent out lots to uh, liberate members for tiny homes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but he reached out and uh, he, he appreciated the, uh, the story, <laughs> the, the guy who uh, we covered that story for. Um, if you guys are watching this, yeah, um, let us know how what worked out with that case. Uh, but yeah, uh, reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to, to I guess, champion for you, right? Uh, to speak out for you. That's usually what happens to like, a lot of homeless people. There's no way there to advocate for them. And so a lot of uh, people who don't have that kind of community are easy picking for, for the police state. And in that case, um, so with that, this is Cal Maloney. Hope you guys enjoy your uh, news from underground segment. This is Phil. And this is Herzog. See you guys at Victory Party. Take good care. Responsibility.